confirmation bias is very well known uh, thinking error. And it's basically, as the name says, it means that it's a tendency to confirm what we already believe. And the, it's very well known and people tend to think that they know what it is and they don't commit those. It's the ones who are stubborn or narcissistic or whoever belongs to the opposite political party. And the, also the premise behind that is that um, confirmation bias is committed because there's some kind of a bad intention behind it. There's some selfish motivation to just stick with what they already believe. It's like a, you know, cult, uh, it's some agenda that they have to stick with. But the problem is that it happens to anybody almost every moment. That is U Kyung An, a psychology professor at Yale University and the author of Thinking 101, How to Reason Better to Live Better. She's talking about one of the most common biases in the behavioral science lexicon, confirmation bias. U Kyung makes the case that there are good reasons for confirmation bias, like how it saves us energy and how it helps bring consistency to our lives. But there are some problems that can go along with confirmation bias. One problem is that this energy-saving feature limits our willingness to take a risk. This can lead to really limited thinking. So if you want to get into a groove that really maximizes your results, beware of confirmation bias. And with that, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Tim Houlihan. And I'm Mary Califf. And our regular listeners might have noticed that my voice is not normally a voice you hear on the podcast. So I should let you know that Kurt had some travel complications that got in the way of a couple of our interviews, uh, including this one. So I filled in and I really enjoy talking with these guests. Mary Califf is Behavioral Group's producer, and she was kind enough to go on the air to keep our obligations with our guests. So thanks very much, Mary, for jumping in and thanks for joining me here today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Tim. Thank you for asking me to join you. <laughs> well, as we noted, U Kyung An is the John Hay Whitney Professor of Psychology and the Director of Thinking Lab at Yale University. Dr. An's main area of research interest is higher level reasoning processes. But our conversation in this episode focuses on her book, Thinking 101, How to Reason Better to Live Better. In our conversation with Dr. An, she discussed her insights into confirmation bias theory of mind, love, and even bloodletting. Bloodletting. I thought, I thought bloodletting is illegal. <laughs> of course it is, Tim. But she's got a really good story about it that I think our listeners will want to hear. Oh, bloodletting. Okay, go figure. All right. <laughs> with that, Groovers, we hope you'll sit back with a bit of hope to overcome our confirmation bias. And we hope that you enjoy our conversation with U Kyung An. Kyung An, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you for having me here. It is our pleasure. And we are going to start with a speed round. We have to know coffee or tea? Coffee. Good. Good. No I like hesitation. That. I like that. I like that. I like the conciseness and the quickness of that answer. That, that was terrific. Okay. Okay. Mary? So moving on to another beverage, would you rather do a wine tasting competition with red wine or white wine? White wine. <laughs> <laughs> and just out of curiosity, why why is that? Uh, red wine gives me headaches sometimes, <laughs> and red wine feels like I'm eating food. It's too mm -hmm. intense. <laughs> We're referencing a story in the book, which a lovely story about wine tasting that you tie in to uh, to talk about biases. But we can come on to that. So I'll let I'll let Tim do the next question. <laughs> <laughs> we will do. Okay, so this is uh, this might sound a little bit familiar, but but what color are traffic lights? <laughs> <laughs> Red, green, and amber. <laughs> and amber. <yeah. laughs> uh, do you want to just feel, uh, uh, yeah. help our listeners understand why that's such a funny question? Because uh, you know everybody says it's yellow. And when my son was four years old, he asked me uh, while I was driving him, he, he asked me what, why they call the yellow light yellow. And I thought, oh, my gosh, was my husband colorblind? <laughs> I did not know about it. And I said, well, it's called yellow light because it's yellow. And he said, Ma, 
stop for a change and <laughs> look at it. And I looked at it and he said, it's orange. And it was really orange. And I've been seeing that as a yellow color all my life. And I yeah. was so sure about it because everybody called mm-hmm. it yellow. And that's, that's kind of an example of a confirmation bias that I use that this can happen even if you don't mean it badly. Or I, I mean, I have no benefit of claiming it a yellow <laughs> color at all. Right. <laughs> but I just saw that mm-hmm. as yellow. Yeah. It's fascinating. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Last speed drag question. Are people better or worse at dancing than they imagine? Oh, they are much worse. Than, <laughs> uh, 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 there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not just dancing, but everything. Um, <laughs> when I, so I came to America from Korea right after college, and I had to take this English as a second language before I worked as a teaching assistant for a course. And uh, the instructor was amazing. She did not have to teach us much. She just tape recorded, video recorded what we were talking. And then that was enough feedback for us to realize what we're doing wrong. So Ah. it's just like that. Just videotape your dancing and you will know. (laughs) that. (laughs) Yeah, right away. (laughs) Oh, that's fantastic. And and I love that it's, uh, we we pretty much, we humans are just so good at, at that misattribution uh, on on so many things. Uh, we are talking about your book. We want to talk about your book, Thinking 101. Uh, and it's based on a class that you created at Yale, right? To what degree yeah. is the um, is the book sort of a, a, a reflection or a, a mirror image of, of the class? Uh, so the book covers about one third uh, of what I cover in the course. And also I try to get rid of all the mathematical stuff <laughs> that's related to behavioral economics and also computational modeling. Um, those are really dense ones. Yeah. So there are some issues that I cover for the sake of science, which is like understanding the deeper uh, cognitive mechanisms underlying various like learning or biases and so on. But um, for this book, I mean, I wrote this book for essentially for my daughter, who was also a student at Yale, but she could not take my course. And I know her attention span. <laughs> so this was really tailored for people like my daughter, who would not, who's not serious about measuring psychology. Uh, who does not care about, you know, mechanistic uh, basis of the cognition. So, and who just wants to learn about what she's doing wrong in her life. <laughs> so, yeah. I love just, that, uh, actually. Yeah. That, I, that just seems so reasonable, you know, to mm-hmm. say, okay, I've got a very specific audience in mind. Dan Pink talks about always having someone very specific in mind that he's writing for. And it was your daughter. So it was someone that you you know pretty well. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I love it. So Thinking 101 is about critical thinking. So it's not a philosophy book. Um, it, it's, 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 it's really based on uh, behavioral science, behavioral economics. Why did you omit the math then? If, if, if math is kind of part of evaluating uh, setups, why say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to put that aside for, for this 101 book? So... I do cover some math in the book. I talk about Bayesian theorem. I talk about uh, certainty effect, why that's irrational using uh, mathematical proofs. But um, I don't think that, I mean, it is just a proof showing in what sense things are irrational. But I don't think people really need to know that level of it. And it doesn't really get to their gut level uh, response, it's much better. What I tried to do in the course, and also I consistently tried to do in the book, was to talk about real life examples uh, because people don't really think in terms of numbers or math. Uh, you know, the, you know, this kind of statistics or math that we talk about nowadays is very contemporary concepts and we are not evolved to 
think in terms of numbers. And, um, you know, there's still some cultures that use, uh, they don't have even labels for high uh, numbers. They just go like one, two, and many. That's it. <laughs> so we are not really wired, biologically wired to think that way. It's much better to talk about specific concrete examples. And that's, that really resonates better with the audience, I think. Mm. You do a great job in the book of uh, exactly what you say, bringing up stories, bringing up real life examples. And it, it just makes it a pleasure to read because you can really relate to, to the points you're illustrating. And the, and the big theme of your book is, is talking about thinking problems and, and what thinking problems are. So maybe just, just give our listeners a bit of background. Like why, why did you make that the premise of your book and, and what are thinking problems exactly? So thinking problems became uh, one of the main topics in cognitive psychology since 1970s, 1980s. And up until that point, people, including like really smart people like philosophers or psychologists, they thought people are rational. And the entire field of economics is based on the premise that we are rational human beings. We make rational choices. And in 1980s, many psychologists, including Kahneman and Tversky, the big names, they decided, they started showing uh, how irrational humans are. And the more we think about it, it's actually, in some sense, it's kind of a obvious because we are limited in our cognition, in our brain power, in our lifespan, um, you know, what we can do computationally. All these things are very limited. So, we are bound to make thinking errors. So the question is what kind of thinking errors we are making and in what, in what sense these are problems. And these are very important to recognize because the first step is to understand what, what errors we make in everyday life before we start trying to improve our thinking skills. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's beautifully said, actually. And it, it, it certainly does make me think that um, we are still, I mean, it, I mean, we've been studying this topic. Researchers have been studying this for, you know, 30, 40 years. And, and yet we're still really, uh, in, in some ways, it feels like we're just on the, on the forefront of actually kind of making a, making it, uh, making it our world better because of it. Um, and, um, and I think that I'm, I'm grateful that, that you wrote this for people with short attention spans so that hopefully we can reach a broader audience, right? That there could be, there could be a greater proliferation of this kind of thought. Thank you. Uh, so I'm also curious about the link between satisfying, maximizing and confirmation bias. Can you, can you tell us a, a, a little bit about that? Okay. So, Confirmation bias is very well known, uh, thinking error. And it's basically, as the name says, it means that it's a tendency to confirm what we already believe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think the yellow traffic light is yellow, then you see it as yellow. Okay. <laughs> um, and, um, the, it's very well known and people tend to think that they know what it is. And they don't commit those. It's the ones who are stubborn or narcissistic or whoever belongs to the opposite political party. They're the ones who commit the confirmation bias and not us. And the, also the premise behind that is that um, confirmation bias is committed because there's some kind of a bad intention behind it. Um, there's some selfish motivation to to just stick with what they already believe. It's like a in a cult, uh, it's some agenda that they have to stick with. But the problem is that it happens to anybody almost every moment. So for example, I drink coffee first thing in the morning every day, and I do that to wake up. And that is a confirmation bias as well, because I believe that co drinking coffee wakes me up, it energizes me, but I, what I should have done to overcome the confirmation bias is try to test whether I can wake up without drinking coffee. <laughs> and it could be just because of the sunlight 
or just moving around that makes me uh, uh, wake up and energize myself. And but it's just a, you know I take coffee every morning because if I don't don't I believe that coffee wakes me up, and if I don't drink it, then I feel like my day is going to be completely ruined. I won't have any <laughs> energy to go to my first meeting. So it's too risky to try to disconfirm my hypothesis by not drinking coffee on Monday morning. And that seems like, oh my gosh, how would I do that? My Monday is all gone then. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? So that is all example of a confirmation bias that we commit at every single moment. I mean, we go to the same supermarket, we go to the same hair salon, and you know, we buy the same black shoes and so on. And the reason why we do that is that we could, of course, try to disconfirm my hypothesis and act like a scientist, right? By trying what happens if I don't do it. But that's too much work on our part. We don't have time for that. We don't, it's too risky. I mean, also, you know, just because you want to test whether your husband is the best husband you can, you can ever have, you cannot divorce just to disconfirm your hypothesis and try someone else. That, yeah. Hope, that would be ridiculous. Not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so. So the reason why we have this confirmation bias is it saves our energy and it gives some kind of consistency in our life. So that's where the maximizing and satisfying comes in, Mm -hmm. right? We could maximize all our searches. And so before you buy or choose a birthday gift for your daughter, you could like spend hours and hours online and interviewing people what could be the best gift for my daughter but I don't have time for that so I need to have operate based on on what I know and and choose a gift given that so that is satisfying good enough you have to satisfy it it's good enough it's sufficient so you stop it there so that, in fact, um, they had looked at um, happiness of the people who are categorized as maximizers versus satisfiers. By the way, I'm a maximizer. I get the highest score on the on that scale. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> I know I'm very proud of it. Should be. Um, and uh, uh, people who are satisficers tend to be happier than people who are maximizers. Mm -hmm. So there is this adaptive reason why we commit confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm sorry, Mary, you were... were No, I I was going to say the same thing. That's a great answer. That's a great tie-in with the confirmation bias as well. Um, One of the things you talk about in the book is, is focusing on the problems that come from people having a different perspective. And we interviewed, you maybe know David McRaney, he's a, he is a podcaster and he's also the author of uh, How to Change Minds. And he's he's spent a lot of time researching this topic, how to change somebody's mind, how to change somebody who's got a different perspective than you. But you take a slightly different approach in the book and you say sometimes it's easier and better to focus on solving the problems caused by different perspectives than trying to change those perspectives themselves. So should we be less focused on, you know, trying to change somebody's mind when we're talking to somebody and just focus on, okay, what's the outcome? What's, how do we move forward from this? So the first problem here is that um, since the confirmation bias is so wired, you know, we are kind of born with it. It's really difficult to, to try to change someone's mind about something especially important and uh, it's like almost ch- trying to convert someone into a different religion. So in some sense, it is better to give up on that and trying to solve the specific problems that you have because you have different opinions about something rather than trying to tell the person that you are wrong, you should change your mind because then they're going to be just defensive and uh, you will never get uh, you know, to the actual solution. Although it is also important to, you know, take the other person's perspective, 
But at the same time, there's another problem behind it, which is that we might not even know what the other person's perspective really is. Mm -hmm. And we think we are overconfident in thinking that we know what others are thinking. (laughs) So... And this happens all the time. So, you know, with my husband, who was a wonderful husband. And, uh, you know, we we just spent five months in Southern Asia, Singapore, and we traveled everywhere there for five months without having a single argument, Yay! which is weird. Wow. I know, we're so impressed that we did that. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. And even, even in that case, um, I realized, oh my gosh, I really did not realize how much my husband loves Southeast Asian food. <laughs> And he didn't realize how much I don't like Southeast Asia. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, okay. Wow. Yeah, we had to talk about it explicitly because we assumed that we know each other's taste. We've been married for you know nearly 30 years oh together. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. So and this just we came to, out? This, you yeah, just, it just, oh, it, it wow. just came out. <laughs> so oh. we had to talk about it and then have to decide, okay, look. When having separate lunch, you can eat as much Southeast Asia food as you want. <laughs> so we had to explicitly talk about it, but we did, I, did, I had no idea before that. Where does this come from? How, how is it that we believe that we mm-hmm. we already know yeah. someone else's perspective? Like because yeah, because we project what we're thinking, right? So if I I am tapping a song, right? Which song was I tapping? Uh, you were tapping Happy Birthday. Yes, got it. Yes, got because, it. Uh, yes I'm sorry. I, maybe, I, maybe I should have, I, I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Let's, we can try another yes, one. Yes, yes. Oh. Actually, yes. Do another one. What is this? I have no idea. So in my mind, because I'm tapping, I have uh, the the song in my mind, right? I'm playing it in my head as I'm t- tapping. So it's obvious that what song I'm tapping and I'm almost scared that you guys will guess what it is <laughs> because because then this demo doesn't work yeah right right sorry, sorry about in the actual, happy birthday thing yeah <laughs> in um actual experiment they tapped 120 songs and only about what is it like less than 10 songs were guessed correctly guessed wow so, but the the point is, it's not only that it's hard to guess, it's that the people who are tappers, they think that the listener would be easily able to guess what, what the song is because mm-hmm. it's right in their mind. Mm-hmm. So if you know what the correct answer is, it looks so obvious uh, that they should also know it. So when I say, for example, do I look fat in this dress? Then I have some, you know, I have an intention. I'm hoping that my husband will say, no, uh, you don't, right? <laughs> Obviously, that's the correct answer. But my <laughs> husband has no idea what he has to say to that, <laughs> what I want to hear, right? Uh, as long as we know the right answer, I think that that's, we're, we're good on that, though. <laughs> I'm hoping after 30 years, he's figured out the right answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> no, he still thinks uh, the correct answer, truly correct answer first. <laughs> uh, 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 oh. okay. Which is one of the reasons why I'm married to him still, because he's so honest and straightforward. Well, there you go. Oh, oh, okay, so I, I, I just do have to ask, what song were you tapping? <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a twinkle, twinkle little star. Oh, that was obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after happy birthday, right? <laughs> Should have. Yeah. yeah, but but uh, didn't. I I love that though, and and it is interesting how like these things seem to be built in. Like you you talked about confirmation bias being hardwired. Mm-hmm. Why is it that things like that or or that educated women underestimate the credentials of other educated women. You know, how, how is it that, that these biases can just be so deeply ingrained in us? 
Right. So where should I start? So let's think about some hypothetical situations. So let's say you are a CEO of a company, all right? And then you you looked at the, you know, applicants and they're mostly male. And it turned out that the good ones are all male also. So you ended up hiring 100% male. Uh, so your company has only male employees. And you know, they were credentials that were good to start out with. They were selected from the, you know, the applicants. So they do a good job. And so what's your belief at that point? Then you're going to believe that, okay, men are good at this job. Uh, so what do you do next? You continue hiring men uh, after men, right? And it feels so risky to try uh, to disconform your hypothesis and hire women for that job. And that's exactly how the stereotype happens, uh, how prejudice and stereotype develops. Because from your perspective, you were your hypothesis was confirmed. Men were good at job. You have a data for it to prove it, quote unquote, prove it. So based on this limited set of um, observation, you actually keep on going on with your current hypothesis. So this is what happened with bloodletting in human history. So bloodletting is a medical malpractice now. We know that it's a malpractice. Uh, so they let the blood out when someone is sick. And this was practiced in Western society for over 2,000 years, up until very recently. So George Washington presumably died of bloodletting when he had a throat infection. They re- released about like two liters of his blood or something. So he probably died of blood loss. And how could these smart people, I mean, after all, by the time there was a George Washington, they discovered the earth is round and we're not the center of this uh, universe and so on. They were very, very smart people. How could they still believe in bloodletting? Because every time people get sick, they use the bloodletting and people get got better. And the the truth is people just get better spontaneously. It was not because of bloodletting, but nobody dared to tr- uh, try not using bloodletting when they're sick. And as a result, they were confirmed about their hypothesis and they kept on using the same thing. Wow. So can I develop the question a bit further? Uh, so you, you give the example of men you know, using this confirmation bias. But why is it that highly educated women also hold that bias, even if they're in that category that they believe that men are more competent and better at the job? Yeah. So the study you're referring to is the one uh, they did with uh, science professors. So there are male professors and uh, female professors who are uh, participants of the experiment. And uh, they were at a very presi- prestigious uh, universities, and they received. Uh, they were presented with this uh, made-up resume, someone who is applying f- uh, as a lab manager, and it was identical resume except that for half of the participants it had John as a name, for the other half it was Jennifer as a name, and they were asked to estimate how competent this candidate was or how worthy of mentoring, or how much uh, salary they would like to offer. And this, you can kind of expect what happened, right? The uh, uh, John received about over $3,000 more salary offer than Jennifer, even though they are exactly the same resume. And what said, what Mary was referring to, is a, is a finding that even female professors did the same thing about Jennifer as opposed to John. So why is that? It's because from their mind, it's not that these people, these female professors want to perpetuate sexism in science. Of course, that's not their goal. But what they had been seeing in their community is that there are more male scientists right now and they're doing great job. Their colleagues are all male and they're getting Nobel Prize. They're getting, you know, all these amazing prizes, making discoveries. So they also see the data that way. And as a result, they did think, they think they're doing the best thing, but it was an environment. It was a biased data that they have that leads to that kind of belief. And that's hard to discover, isn't it? It, it kind of gets back to this idea. If uh, I love your example of the CEO that hires a bunch of men who do a good job and 
And so without even thinking, well, why should I try to disprove my hypothesis when the company's running great? I mean, they're doing a, a good work. How how do you pry open the, the the mind of that person to say, what about the alternative? What about the, the counter version of what you're doing? So I offer two suggestions. Number one is that's where the institution has to step in because at the individual level, it's really hard to overcome. It feels just too risky. So at Yale, if we are looking for minority candidates for professor job, then uh, they, Yale, is willing to create a new position for us if there's a you know promising candidate for that. So th- the institution can not only regulate, but more like provide incentives to uh, look at the more diverse uh, samples like that. The second one is at an individual level, what we could do is that since trying new things feels so risky, we probably could start practicing disconfirming our existing hypothesis at a smaller scale. So what I do in my own life is I always try a new recipe every week on Sunday. It could be a great, huge success. It could be a complete failure. My <laughs> husband is all for that anyway. <laughs> great. But I just try, I have to try a new recipe every week. And the other thing you could do is instead of going to the, you know, my um, office using the same route. I sometimes try detour. I try some different route and try to discover some new stores, new restaurants on the way. So these are all the things that we can try uh, in a random ways. And the biggest thing that I did in my life was uh, I had a teaching uh, opportunity at Singapore last semester. So I took that. This is a perfect way to break my um, routine. So I spent five months uh, in Singapore teaching there, and it was eye-opening experience. It was just remarkable. I'm still digesting what I have learned, so mm-hmm. don't ask me what I learned. <laughs> okay, okay. By going there yet. Okay. But um, uh, one thing that I learned was how ethnocentric the psychology research was. So when I presented some oh. uh, phenomena to these yeah, students, yeah. they realized, no, I would never say that like that. How? Why? Why are they doing? It? <laughs> like, so I, I'm still digesting. Maybe um, this might lead to my new career in cross cultural studies. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I mean the the weird versus the non weird countries. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> and it kind of ties in with what I was going to jump to next, which is identity and how identity plays a part in our thinking. And maybe it's too early to really uh, take some examples from your recent experience in Singapore, but there's individualistic societies, which obviously the United States is, and collective societies. How do those play into our um, identity and, and, and how we think? Identity. So, I mean, being in collective, so I grew up in collective society and you are defined by other people. And so... There's a study that shows that people in the collective, uh, st- uh, collective society are better at taking other people's perspectives than people mm-hmm. in the individualistic society. Uh, so that could be a good thing, but it can be also a bad thing in a sense that those people in the collective society could be a lot more self-conscious. They might be more prone, uh, affected by other people's opinion uh, or critiques. So, so there's pros and cons in everything. So it's not like one society is better than the other, but yeah. Mm. That, yeah, it, it, it is fascinating. And um, I, I mentioned the, the, the weird versus non-weird and uh, it's, it's kind of shocking that, that so much of the literature that we have out there, so many of the psychological foundations that we buy into have been based on largely college students in the, in the <laughs> Northeastern United States, where you happen to be, of course, uh, right now. So, right. Oh, by the way, um, now, so it's been um, over 10 years. It's been about 15 or 20 years. We uh, now have new tools to conduct all this kind of experiments online. So we, and also there are these companies that have a setup uh, to recruit the participants. 
So they do all the transaction of payment and everything. All I need to do is to give my credit card and then post my experiment online. And I can get like 300 subjects across the country, age from 18 to infinite. And, uh, and then I get that in like 30 minutes. So it's things are, are changing. Yeah. So hopefully this can, if this, something like this can go into like Korea, you know, Japan, China, then I might be able to more easily do the cross cultural studies as well. Something that we talk about on, uh, on behavioral grooves is theory of mind. And you make a distinction between emotional theory of mind and cognitive theory of mind. Could you spend a few minutes and, and share with our listeners the, the, the differences between those two? So cognitive uh, theory of mind is knowing what other people are thinking or feeling. It's just basically knowing what they're thinking. Emotional uh, theory of mind is empathy. It's more like really feeling what they're feeling together. And the best way to illustrate the difference is to talk about a psychopath. So psychopath, uh, they think that, you know, people t- tend to think that they don't have a theory of mind. They don't know what other people are thinking, but that's wrong. They have to know whether what other people are feeling or thinking in order to manipulate their mind in order to predict what they're going to do next or what can cause pain on them, right? So they're extremely good at cognitive theory of mind, but what they're lacking is emotional theory of mind. They don't feel their pain. As a result, they don't remorse. They don't feel guilty. Yeah. Oh, that it's just, I'm sorry. Just, just it <laughs> makes me think about all the political issues that are, uh, and yeah. some of the people we have on the the main yeah. stage. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Mary, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, um, same thing. It's fascinating. Um, uh, one of the things you talk about in the book as well is the that we're, uh, listeners will be very familiar with this is the planning fallacy. Mm-hmm. And and I love you. You've got your own personal way of overcoming the planning fallacy. So <laughs> can you explain, to, you know, to, should we could do a step by step plan or what is your trick for overcoming the the, the demon of the yeah. planning fallacy. So planning fallacy happens still to me all the time. <laughs> so it happened to me this morning. <laughs> so I woke up, <laughs> I woke up at six thirty, and I had a coffee, of course, <laughs> and <laughs> and then I was preparing for this meeting, and I thought, okay, I have about like two hours, three hours before this. So uh, I can go over the topics. I can kind of remind myself what examples I use, what I talked about in the book and so on. And that should be more than enough. And then I can walk my dog and I can water the garden before the, you know, 930 meeting and so on. I love it. And and guess what happens when I go over these topics? Um, I don't quite remember what examples I use. So I had to search for them. Uh, and then I felt like, oh, yeah, why did I use that example? Like, there's a better example. I started thinking, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, what happened to that one? And that reminds me of something else. I started searching for something else on the web. I get distracted. And, and then I started, oh, yeah. And then BTS is now being published by Fluid <laughs> Iron. That's my publisher. So I have to text my editor, like, wow, that, what a great news. I'm at the BTS level now, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we chatted for a while and so on. And of course, now it's 9.15. I realized <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I need to set up my microphone and so on. So the, my dog had not been walked. Uh, my, my garden had not been watered yet. Uh. <laughs> and this is very typical. It's a familiar story for yeah. everybody. And uh, and the pro- problem is when we plan on something, we say w- we do exactly what I just said, right? Uh, I will spend two hours on this, one hour on docking, walking the dog, and you know, and so on. That's gonna all fit in the three hours spent. But then that's a fluency effect because when we plan on something, we only think about the next steps, uh, step one, step two, step three, that goes fluently. And in that imag- in mental simulation. It just feels like it's going to just go smoothly. So it's like watching a TikTok. Uh, someone is making a chopped salad uh, in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just like that. And of course, you, you, it's not going to take 30 seconds. So maybe you know that it's not going to take 30 seconds. So you say, okay, I think it's going to take about five minutes. No, it takes about <laughs> 20 minutes to wash and chop all those all right. vegetables. Okay. So what we should do, well, in case of chopped salad, you can get the feedback uh, right away by just making it, just trying out, right, and see what happens. And you know that it takes more than five minutes for sure. But when it comes to planning, you can't really try that out. I mean, the whole point of planning is planning without trying out, right? right. We're projecting the future. So it's really difficult to overcome this uh, fluency effect. So what I do is I basically like double my estimate or I just squeeze in the things that could be easily dropped. I'm sorry, my dog, but my dog can be walked later in this afternoon. It does not have to be this morning. My flower garden is thriving without me watering today. So as long as I have some wiggle rooms uh, and that's, it's not going to be a disaster. And I really have to convince myself but still at these d- d- days that planning fallacy is bound to work. Oh, my favorite story was uh, I was trying to, one summer, I was trying to update my lecture on planning fallacy with more contemporary literature. And I thought that's going to take three days. It took me three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The irony. <laughs> there it is. Yep. There it is. I, that's pretty perfect. I, I, Kahneman has a great story about, about planning fallacy as well. Oh, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> he does that too. All the time. All the time. <laughs> so, so Kang, do you think there's a, a, a thinking 102 or a thinking 201, you know, uh, it, it coming? Yeah, I don't know. I have not talked to my editor about it. And I don't know, maybe I could talk about like creativity or it could be more topic oriented, like fake news. Why do we commit fake? Uh, why do we fall for fake news? What can we do about it? Or like climate change? Why is it that not everybody's involved in it? And climate change is kind of related to one of the topics I talk about in the in the Thinking 101 book, which is about delayed gratification, because the reward we are going to get by working on the climate change is too far in the future. So, and we tend to discount the future rewards. So as that's one of the mechanisms behind, you know, people not working on the climate change. So... There are many topics that I'm, I think I can do it, but I'm not sure whether uh, I'm still debating on it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that ties in with the last chapter of your current book, Thinking 101, which I really enjoyed. It was about uncertainty and, you know, thinking in the future and how things can be ambiguous or, you know, we don't know what's coming down the line. And you have a lovely quote that said, uncertainty about significant future outcomes can immobilize our decision making. So it it's it's just highlighting the fact that when sometimes we feel completely immobilized from this the ambiguity of our situation. So what are some of the the tools that we can use, what are some of the things that we can put in place to help us with that decision making when things are ambiguous or uncertain? So I talked about multiple things. So the immobilizing is, oh, I see what you're talking about, the disjunction effect. Okay. So in the study, when people, it basically what it showed was if people don't know the outcome of some important event, so like you just had a job interview, you don't know whether you got the job or not. You took an important exam. You don't know whether you passed or not. You're making some business deal. You don't know whether it went through or not. And so on. So you're just waiting to hear what's going to happen in the future. But there are some other things that you could do no matter what. So you might uh, want to uh, propose to your boyfriend, you know, whether you got the job or not. You love your boyfriend for sure. But then people's tendency is not to propose to the boyfriend until you find out whether you got the job or not. Mm -hmm. And that's what the immobilization means, right? We Mm -hmm. can be paralyzed and we can just stop um, making any decisions, even though, even in the case that our decision is going to be the same no matter what. So, for example, when I was waiting for the result of the presidential election in, when was that? 
20, 20, yeah. 20, 20, which was a thousand years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. I, I, there was some writing that I had to get done. I think it was a writing for this book uh, in, 19, uh, in 2020. And I could not work on it. No matter, so no matter who gets elected, <laughs> I, I'm always supposed to write this. Right. Thing. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> and yet, and, and, <laughs> there, yeah. and, and, and it's so ridiculous, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm so glad you're better? saying that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> we've, we've because all been there. Yeah. We've been there, right? Yeah. We all relate to that. And it does not matter. I, there's nothing I could do about the outcome mm -hmm. <laughs> at that right. point. No, no. But it's because of this uncertainty, we just can't even do the things that we're going to do anyway. So in that case, you just need to separate out the uncertainty to two different certain outcomes. Either A will be the present or B will be the present. If A becomes a present, do I have to write this? Yes. <laughs> if B becomes a present, do I have to write this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that kind of flow chart effect of it all yes. coming down to the same answer. What really yes. fascinated me about the research uh -huh. that you're highlighting is that regardless it was it was about an exam wasn't it and students were finding yeah. out did they pass or did they fail and, yes. and what didn't matter was whether they passed or they failed what mattered was the uncertainty so that their behavior wasn't different if they passed or they failed but you would think would have a you know a passing an exam failing exam could have fairly different outcomes on what's coming next depending on how big the exam is but that it, it was the uncertainty, not knowing that stalled us, not the actual definitive outcome. So kind of like the election, just that really weird space of not knowing just completely stalls us. I love that. I love that insight. Yeah. I mean, of course, there are things that you have to wait, right? Mm. To find the, you know, you don't want to buy a house until you find out whether you got the job, right? Exactly. So exactly. there are things that are uh, dependent on the, on the outcome. But if there are things that are independent of what happens, then you just need to move on, carry mm. on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and in the spirit of just having to carry on, just imagine that you were assigned to work on a desert island for a year. And you get to take two artists, two musical artists' music with you. And you get the whole catalog. It's not just, you know, one song or, or one one record. But what, what two musical artists would you would you want to take along with you? Oh my gosh, I thought about only one, which was um <laughs> any any album by Yo Yo Ma. <laughs> Good call. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. yeah. Uh, his birthday is the same as mine. Uh, really? Well, so is Putin. Oh. <laughs> we don't need to mention that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. Win some, lose some. Okay. I know. I know. Uh, I haven't thought about the second one. Maybe I'll just say BTS. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Because I just learned that BTS book is going to come out from the Flatiron, which was the publisher of my book. <laughs> I think that that's just fantastic, though, that your publisher is is your publisher and BTS's publisher. Like that's. <laughs> and, and I like that both of your answers, you have a, psycholo a close psychological distance to both of them. You know, you, <laughs> oh, yeah. you feel close to both of them for different reasons reasons but yeah <laughs> yeah for, for different reasons well uh ukyung ang thank you so much for being a guest on behavior groups today we really enjoy the conversation thank you for having me i really enjoyed it Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I will groove on what we've learned from our, our discussion with Dr. Ann and have a free-flowing conversation and whatever else comes into our confirmation bias minds. <laughs> that works great. That totally works great, Mary. Nice job. I'm try I, I was trying to jump into Kurt's mind to think about what would Kurt... Oh. Mind? That's at the end. I should stop We're trying to be have to make Kurt. a note of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that a, was that an emotional theory of mind Ooh, or a cognitive theory of mind? Good tie in with the interview. That's uh, <laughs> trying to jump into Kurt's mind is a good uh, example of theory of mind. I don't know if I've mastered it. <laughs> 
It's pretty great stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I, we could probably spend our whole grooving session focused on theory of mind, on the differences between mm-hmm. the emotional and the cognitive. But let me ask you this, Mary, what, what struck you most about our conversation with Dr. Ahn? By far the biggest thing that stood out in the book, and I was so happy to talk to Dr. Anna about it at the end of the conversation, was the uncertainty of future outcomes. I was really taken with this research that shows that we, on future, uh, uncertain future outcomes affects our decision making. And not in the way that I predicted. I thought, you know, if you, if you've taken an exam, you don't know the results, you are stuck in this realm of uncertainty. I would have thought if the ex- if you had failed the exam, that would have really affected our decision making as well. That would have had a negative right. effect on on what we did next. But it isn't. It's the uncertainty. It's that time in the middle of not knowing what it is. And when we know the outcome one way or the other, we're much better equipped to move forward. And I think it just shows that we are just naturally hardwired. Our brains do not like uncertainty. We not we don't like this ambiguous space. And I've had a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Tim, as you know, we've moved country in the last year. And right, <laughs> right. as right as we were moving, you know, our stuff was being shipped. Our son had a big health scare. And I remember this paralyzed feeling that she talks about of, I don't, I don't know whether to move forward, move back. Do we stall? Do we, you know, everything became like, I didn't even know what to make for dinner because I just felt there was too much uncertainty to do anything. Yeah. And it yeah. really struck home with me that, okay, you you can keep moving forward. I love her flow chart of, okay, talking about the <laughs> yes. presidential I, uh, election, you know, if, if candidate A wins, do I still need to write this paper? Yes. Yes. If yeah. candidate B wins, do I still need to write this paper? Yes. Okay, then write the paper. Uh, they'll write the damn paper. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Don't screw around. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, but it's hard I, when we're in those moments of uncertainty. Our brain doesn't know what to do, how to process it. Really, it builds on a bunch of conversations that we've had, right? Mm. But and and I'll, I'll touch on those in just a second. First, I just wanted to remind people, remind our listeners that there is a difference in risk and uncertainty, but, but they feel the same. This is, I think this is a huge problem for us that is not really uh, discussed enough, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that we, we still feel our body feels the same, whether it's a risky situation or an uncertain situation. And risk is really actually having a pretty good feel for what is likely to happen, but we're just assessing some you know, degree of failure or success to it, mm-hmm. uh, to that risk. So we generally have a, a pretty good feel for what's going to happen. Uncertainty is really just not knowing what's ahead. And, and that's, uh, and that's the hard one, mm-hmm. but unfortunately they feel the same, mm-hmm. uh, to our guts. Uh, so I, I just want to point that out, but getting back to this idea, this, this idea about dealing with uncertainty, we have talked about it as recently as just a couple of weeks ago when we talked to Adam Alter mm-hmm. with getting unstuck, mm-hmm. right? Because he absolutely focuses on this. And uh, the perseverance is just, it's just necessary from time to time to to just kind of keep pushing through, mm. you know, uh, you know, as you're walking through the valley of death, just keep walking, mm. as, as they say. Mm. Um, and also, I'm going to go back even longer before that. Our conversations with Annie Duke are always refreshing and rewarding and important to bring up that trying to get away from this dyadic thinking, this this monotonic kind of idea of yes or no, that there can be degrees of things happening or likelihoods of things happening. So thinking in bets or thinking in percentages Mm -hmm. rather than in absolutes can be a really helpful tool. Mm Uh, what uh, what else you know came to mind uh, for you? I think those are great points because it it removes this need for certainty. You know, did we pass the exam? Mm-hmm. Did we fail the exam? You can still keep moving forward and taking steps regardless of uh, whether you know for certain. And and our brain likes certainty, but uh, and it and it yeah. likes that hundred percent. You know, thinking about Annie Duke, it likes a hundred percent. But life rarely happens that way, and. <laughs> I, right, right. I I love it. So Nathan and Susanna, for, and I know you missed out on that conversation, Tim. So sorry to bring up a conversation that, that you weren't <sighs> listening to. That was when you were unwell. But they yeah. have, they've written a whole book about dealing with uncertainty. And they ha- they just have so many tools. It's a fabulous book. I would recommend it. 
But one mm-hmm. of the things, you know, there's really simple steps. One of the things they noticed when they were researching uh, a lot of very successful people and a lot of very successful people take a lot of risks. They deal with a lot of uncertain futures because if you're taking a risk, there is overlap between those two things. I, it's great that you've pointed out the feeling is the same between risk and uncertainty, but risk is uncertain. There's an over, there's an overlap in the future. There is an overlap. Yep. And when they researched people who take a lot of risks and, and successfully move forward, um, there were, there were these themes that kept coming up. And one of them was, you know, just making some daily routines that are the same, making it easy for our brains, you know, having the same, eating the same breakfast every day, or as, you know, mm-hmm. the Steve Jobs type, you know, just wear the same polo shirt and jeans every day. You don't need to think about what you're wearing. <laughs> right. Just make it easy. <laughs> right. And those are really easy steps. You know, it can be anything. I have listened to the same podcast at bedtime every night for over a year now because it's just familiar. It kind of sets my brain into that pattern of, OK, I'm going to sleep now and I kind of unwind to it. And it's just easy. I don't think about it. And and those are the kind of steps that kind of tune your brain out so you're not deciding on every single tiny little thing. So I, that that's what I was thinking about when I when I'd heard about the uncertain futures in this interview. Well, I'm glad you brought up Nathan and Susanna's book because I, uh, even though I wasn't available for the interview, I loved the book mm-hmm. as well. This whole idea of embracing the uncertainty, really turning the the common thinking or turning our DNA on its head, I think is really important. Mm-hmm. And and the thing that, that I, I see so much in behavioral science that Kurt and I have talked about, Mary, you and I have talked about this uh, a lot as well, is the degree to which uh, awareness, that, that starts with some awareness. We need to look at our lives and, and be aware of how we're responding. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to actually sort of check in and go, Oh, when I in these uncertain situations, this is how I'm responding. This is how I'm I'm acting. So it starts with awareness, and then after that, you I think it just need to be intentional, mm-hmm. and and that can lead to a whole bunch of interventions, whether it's contextual and environmental, or you know maybe it's a bit of willpower. Maybe you just need to kind of push through from time to time, change the environment, whatever it is that it starts with intentionality, and and I think that. I think Ukyong actually talks a little bit about there's some things that you can test. You, there's some things that you can't test. I'm not going to test to find out whether or not I married the best <laughs> wife ever by test by testing another. That's not, you know that's that's kind of absurd. But there are things in our lives that we can do an A/B test on. We can actually say, well, what if I did it differently? Mm. What if I looked at it differently? Mm. And uh, so I, I I think that that was a really meaningful part of our discussion that just reminds me that we got to start with awareness. Mm. We have to start with kind of waking up, opening up our eyes and just taking a look at it. That's such a good point. Yeah. I love that. And I I totally agree. I'm trying to rack my brain about who we interviewed recently is that sometimes if we're stuck in a situation, if, if we're struggling, talk to ourselves as if we're advising a friend because it makes mm. us take a step back and look at the situation and have an awareness of the situation that is so difficult when you're in it. But if you talk to yourself like you're advising a friend, you develop that level of awareness that you just mentioned. And sometimes that's all you need. Just knowing <laughs> this is really right. uncertain. It feels yeah. like butterflies in my stomach all the time. I don't know what I'm doing. The reason I can't decide what to have for dinner is because my brain is so overloaded with everything else that is uncertain and that's okay like just pick something easy for dinner and that's okay you know just those (laughs) just that awareness of this is why I'm struggling with every decision today is because there's a lot going on and you're right just being aware of that is is a great first step anything else Mary that you wanted to mention from your takeaways you're uh, talking i mean i could talk about uncertainty it's so it's so relevant to me right now i'm excited we've got we've just been sent hal hirschfield's book i think you've got it as well yeah. tim we're going to interview him in a few weeks and it's about your future self how to make tomorrow better today and i'm really excited mm-hmm. to go forward with that because you how you deal with the future, how you think about your future. It ties in with so many behavioral science 
tools that we are we tend to discount future rewards. We're very oh, yes. really bad at thinking about how this will benefit us in the future. And he talks about I've picked it up and had a glance at it. He talks in the epilogue about just this huge collective uncertainty that the pandemic's brought on all of us and how the uncertainty in the present has made it really difficult collectively for us to think about our future. And it makes sense if we can't, if we don't feel certain in our, you know, our current environment, if we don't feel psychologically safe right now, of course, it's really difficult to think ahead about, you know, 10 years, 50 years. And that has big repercussions for things like climate change, because we're, you know, we're not thinking ahead to when our children are older, when our grand, when our unborn ancestors uh, are dealing with our our decisions yes. now. And he has a great quote in the book that the future will arrive whether we've planned for it or not. <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> so I'm excited to jump into <laughs> yeah. that that book and really pull out what he talks about is the thinking the thinking in the future and how, how that changes our our decisions today. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you pointed that out. And uh, I'm looking forward to that conversation with Hal as well. Mm. Um, we have tremendous opportunity, I think, uh, to to do better collectively and uh, individually. So mm-hmm. as Christina Bicchieri said, you know, keep in mind that what, what we do as individuals impacts the social norms because we're part of the social norm. Mm-hmm. So so we get to we get to change the world. Social proof, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mary, I think I think we could. Uh, there's certainly more to to talk about, but I think that that wraps up the central ideas that we wanted to groove on. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Ann's book is a really good uh, overview of lots of biases and how we think, and I definitely recommend listeners go out and read it to get a really full picture of of what she talks about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Groovers, just want to thank you all for listening. For those who listen and subscribe to the podcast, and to be a part of this behavioral science community and for just being a groover. I mean, applying behavioral science can lead to a better life experience, a a little better flourish in your decision making and ultimately a better groove. Yeah. And as the show's producer, I'd love to hear from you on social media. So drop us a hashtag at behavioral groove and that's behavioral groove without the E and the S at the end of the world, uh, at the end of the word. Just let us know what's on. (laughs) It is almost the end of the world. (laughs) (laughs) We're not there yet. (laughs) No, no. But yeah, let us know what you think about this conversation. If you've read our book, you know, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, please do. And with that, we hope that you are a bit more aware of where confirmation bias sits in your life, where uncertainty fits in your life, and that this week it will help you go out and find your groove. Mm -hmm.